Welcome to your Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. We love God. We ought to be able to talk about Him. Getting you started on your day. With the latest in breaking news and information from the Vatican to the White House and everything in between. It's serious. It's fun. It's your Catholic Drive Time. Now, here's your host, Joe McClain. Jesus Christ, welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. It's Friday, praise be to God, July the 22nd, 2022, and you have survived it. You've made it through the entire week. God is so very good. You are hours away from your weekend. Hopefully it'll be a good one. But we have an interesting show for you today. Here's a question. Should Catholics eat fake meat? You know, what about uh, what about that lab-grown protein? We were talking about that. Was it earlier this week? I, I, it was either earlier this week or late last week. We were talking about uh, fake meat made in labs or alternative proteins that de- are derived from bugs, things like that. Should we be forced, as Catholics, to have to uh, switch up? Or what, what about the good old-fashioned steak? Well, we've invited Dr. Anthony Stein to be on the program he is a Catholic. He has a Ph.D. in public policy with a special emphasis on agriculture, uh, food systems, things like that. He's going to be on at 35 past the hour to have a conversation around that very topic. Stick around for that. Guess what? Good news. The Pope has uh, or the Vatican has uh, tapped the brakes on the German Synod. It sounded a little bit like this. No, wait, stop. <laughs> We're going to talk about that a little bit coming up at 15 past the hour. Also, Dave Palmer is going to be on our show at the top of the next hour to uh, see what uh, Thomas Aquinas is teaching these days. But so much in the news. Hey, YouTube is at it again. They've said in addition to not being able to conversate about uh, election results, not being able to conversate about, um, uh, you know, required medications, uh -uh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But they're now saying you're also not allowed to have conversations around abortion, in fact. Uh, They're going to be removing videos that promote ways to perform unsafe abortions. I would say that is a good thing. But they're also not going to stop there. They also include things like trying to link abortions with breast cancer, which, by the way, there are countless studies to to suggest that. But nonetheless, they aren't going to be allowing it. So more censorship on YouTube, which that means Facebook, Twitter, elsewhere as well. Hey, the same-sex marriage bill, remember we covered that? You remember 80 Catholics from the House voted for that? You remember that? I, I, t- I think I talked about that. Well, guess what? Uh, that would require U.S. governments to recognize polygamy in certain states if that becomes law of the land. Oh, and also Catholics also voted for the contraception bill that came through the House yesterday. So that's good times. Hey, the Republican nominee for governor in New York, Rep. Lee Zeldin, was reportedly attacked at a campaign stop in Fairport, New York, yesterday by a knife-wielding man. So uh, pray for that outcome. But good morning to you, Rudy Carlos. (laughs) Good morning, Joe. (laughs) You always give me this... Transition from like really crazy news to hey, by the way, good morning. <laughs> What's yeah, this guy got stabbed. Uh, anyway, good morning to you, Rudy. He tried. It didn't quite work out. But he oh tried. man, yeah. I would hate to be stabbed. Just take me out quickly. Oh man, you just made me think. Just, I saw a video just, the other day just of do it uh, quickly. a guy in uh, South Africa because they don't allow guns there. No guns, mm-hmm. so people are carrying knives to defend themselves. And this guy was being attacked by. I don't know, three or four people uh, on the streets. He was just trying to defend himself. Horrible. And yeah, it was, it's not good. It's not good. Speaking of which, though, Adrian Fonseca is here <laughs> on the ones and twos. Good morning to you, Adrian. Howdy, howdy. Praise be God. It's good to be here. Is it? Well, you know what they say, Joe? What do they say? Well, they say if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. <laughs> right. So the poor guy just failed in his, in his task. I, he failed so. to connect. Mm-hmm. I agree. However, so. they did run away. So praise be to God. Well, there you go. Folks. <laughs> Successful you go. outcome. Nobody was hurt. Well, there you go, folks. Yeah, there you go, folks. So praise be to God. Despite the fact that uh, people are being mm-hmm. attempt, attempted mm-hmm. at being stabbed, mm-hmm. people are mm-hmm. attempting stabbings. There so, we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, it is still good to be here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amen to that. Hey, guess what? Jesus Christ, hashtag Jesus Christ is, is trending on the Twitters right now. So do me a favor. Go praise over there. God. Log in. Leave a little tweet with the hashtag Jesus Christ and maybe support and promote Catholic Drive Time along the way. That would and be share fantastic. Uh, meme. Yeah, that was hilarious yesterday. I created a little meme behind the scenes to have a little fun with Adrian and Rudy. And the next thing you know, the meme shows up in Taylor Marshall's feed. 
<laughs> like I, and I was like, how like, did he Ma, get I'm that? on TV. Like, I'm how did TV. he even get the meme? I mean, I just sent it to the two of you, and then pff, you guys are leaking it out to the world, apparently. So that was fun. At any rate, we're going to pray. We're going to jump in. And today, by the way, we're giving out prizes in the second hour. Join us if you can online, grnonline.com forward slash CDT. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your headlines with Rudy Carlos. Good morning. Thanks for tuning into Catholic Drive Time. Today is Friday, July 22nd, and here are your headlines this morning. This is from Breitbart. The headline goes, As recruiters struggle, Air Force seeks lift from Top Gun. Because of low unemployment numbers and COVID-19, military recruiters are having a tough time finding young people who want to join and can meet the physical, mental, and moral requirements. The Army has been hit the hardest. The situation is somewhat less dire for the Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps. Leaders of those branches say that they hope to meet or just slightly miss their recruiting goals this year. But they say that they will have to dip into their pool of delayed entry applicants, which will put them behind as they begin the next recruiting year. In response, the Air Force is offering bigger bonuses and other incentives to those who sign up, and they're seizing on the boosts that Hollywood may offer, such as the buzz over the sequel to the 1986 hit Top Gun. Reuters reports Turkey says Russia and Ukraine to sign UN grain export deal on Friday today. Pray for that. Russia, Ukraine, and Turkey will gather today to sign a deal proposed by the United Nations to free up grain exports from Ukraine's besieged Black Sea ports, Turkish President Erdogan's office said yesterday. The AP reports Spain and Portugal reject EU plan to limit natural gas use. The governments in Madrid and Lisbon said that they will not support the initiative announced by European Commission President. The proposal would start with voluntary reductions on natural gas usage, but the EU's head office also wants the power to make the 15% savings mandatory in the event of an EU-wide energy emergency. Spain and Portugal said making reductions obligatory was a non-starter. They noted that there are scant energy connections linking them to the rest of Europe and that they use very little Russian gas compared to fellow EU members such as Germany and Italy. They say, quote, we will defend European values, but we won't accept a sacrifice regarding an issue that we have not been allowed to give our opinion on, unquote. Epic Times reports a tremendous success. Several missing children recovered during Alabama human trafficking sting. An extensive operation into human trafficking during the World Games 2022 in Birmingham, Alabama, ended on July 17th with multiple arrests and a recovery of several missing children, praise be to God. The Department of Homeland Security's investigative arms ran the operation. Among those arrested were 34 commercial sex buyers, six human traffickers, and eight men who sought out the trafficked minors online and traveled to meet them for illicit purposes. And those were your headline news this morning. God love you. The saint of the day is St. Mary Magdalene. St. Mary Magdalene is called the penitent. She was a notorious sinner, and she had seven devils removed from her. St. Mary Magdalene was very close to our Lord and Our Lady, helping her and giving her support above all at the supreme moment when her son was crucified and died on Calvary. Fourteen years after our Lord's death, St. Mary Magdalene was put in a boat by the Jews without sails or oars along with Saints Lazarus and Martha, who baptized her, and Sidonius, the man born blind, her maid Sura, and the body of St. Anne, the mother of the Blessed Virgin. They were sent drifting out to sea and landed on the shores of southern France, where St. Mary spent the rest of her life as a contemplative in a cave known as St. Baum. She was given the Holy Eucharist daily by angels as her only food and died when she was 72 years old. She was transported miraculously just before she died to the chapel of St. Maximin, where she received the last sacraments. Her contemplation was marked in contrast with the active life of Martha, who censured Mary for not caring enough about the needs of the house, but only about staying close to our Lord, listening to him and admiring him. Our Lord told her, Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her. 
She represents pure contemplation, unlinked to the act of life. After Jesus' body was been placed in the tomb, Mary went to anoint it with spices early Easter Sunday morning. Not finding the body, she began to weep and seeing someone whom she thought was the gardener. She asked him if he knew where the body of her beloved master had been taken. When she had said this, she turned around and beheld Jesus standing there, and she did not know that it was the Lord. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why art thou weeping? Whom dost thou seek? She, thinking that she was, he was the gardener, said to him, Sir, if they hast removed him, tell me where they have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. Turning, she said to him, Rabboni. Jesus said to her, Do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and, and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord in these things he said to me. For this reason, Mary Magdalene is a model of contemplation and is thus a suitable protectress of the order of preachers, who end in the salvation of souls by the preaching of the truths contemplated. St. Mary Magdalene, protectress of the order of preachers, pray for us. Praise be to God in all things. The gospel today comes to us from John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2 and 11 through 18. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark, and saw that the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. Mary stayed outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she bent over into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they laid him. When she had said this, she turned and saw Jesus there, but did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? She thought it was the gardener and said to him, Sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you laid him, and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop holding on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am going to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and then reported what he told her, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, well, Adrian, what does uh, Cornelius Alapide have to say today on Alapide Friday? Yes, so Cornelius Alapide had a lot to say about the, obviously, the resurrection of our Lord. And here, uh, I think we talked about many times that the situation of do not cling to me, so I'll try to not talk about that. He says here that for pseudo-origin, because, you know, it wasn't quite origin. It was pseudo origin. He says, Oh Mary, if thou art seeking for Jesus, why dost thou not recognize him? And if thou dost recognize him, why art thou seeking for him? Behold, Jesus cometh to thee and he whom thou seekest asketh of thee, woman, why be weepest thou? And thou supposes him to be the gardener as not knowing him. For indeed, Jesus is also the gardener as sowing the good seed in the garden of thy heart and in the hearts of his faithful servants. When St. Gregory says, is he not the gardener who planted in her breast through his love, the flourishing seeds of virtues? And so this is a common thing in Cornelius Lapide here talking about our Lord was identified as the gardener and he is the gardener in several different senses. He is the gardener in the sense that he is the new Adam, the one who tills the forest, tills the garden. He is the gardener in the sense that he plants the good seed. And that will blossom given the fact that we recognize it and we tend to it and we allow it to blossom. But it is our Lord who plants the good seed. So will we allow ourselves, will we recognize our Lord as the gardener, as him who fosters the spiritual life within our souls? So let's meditate upon that and let's pray and ask Mary Magdalene to give us a greater devotion and a greater contemplative life. Amen. Praise be to God. The Pope taps the brakes on the German bishops in their synodal way. We're going to talk about that 
and a lot more coming up right after this very quick break with what's concerning us. That's up next. And uh, Dr. Anthony Stein is also at 35 past the hour. A lot more to come. Stick around. It is here where you'll find the best marriage counselor, greatest healer, wisest teacher, and closest friend. It's a place where you'll escape the chaos of the world and find the lasting peace that only comes from God. Jesus is personally waiting to embrace you now with his divine mercy and healing love. Jesus is calling you home to his sacred heart today. Seventh-day Adventists use Ecclesiastes 9.10 to argue that souls in heaven aren't cognitively aware of our prayers because the inspired author says that souls don't have any knowledge in the afterlife. But this objection fails because the inspired author was operating with a limited and vague view of the afterlife without New Testament revelation. When we come to the New Testament, it's a whole new ballgame. Consider Revelation 5.8, where 24 presbyters, humans, souls surround Jesus and offer him the prayers of Christians on earth in the form of incense. How could they do this if they weren't cognitively aware of all those prayers? So just because an Old Testament passage speaks of the afterlife in a way that's not compatible with the intercession of the saints, it doesn't follow that the Catholic doctrine is proven unbiblical. I'm Carlo Broussard with the ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at 35 past the hour, Dr. Anthony Stein is going to be our guest. He has a couple of YouTube channels. One you might recognize, Return to Tradition, uh, covering the Catholic world. Uh, but he has another one called Practical Carnivore. And um, I just joined this uh, this this diet, this community, this culture, this philosophy of, of a carnivore diet kind of thing. Well, we're going to talk to him about why or if Catholics should eat fake meat, meat grown in labs, be forced to eat bugs, those kinds of things. Uh, we're going to have that conversation with Dr. Anthony Stein coming up at 35 past the hour. But there are, as I say, lots of stories in the news that are of great concern to me, and I'm sure they are to you as well. In fact, there were two stories the last couple of days that uh, we continue to talk about here, but here's one on the German synodal way, right? I mean, they have just been doubling down. I mean, repeatedly, it's like every week or every, you know, there's just some news that comes out of Germany about them embracing what we would consider to be intrinsically evil. Well, uh, yesterday, the Vatican issued a statement on this, and we're going to get into what this means. Here's the headline out of LifeSide News. Pope taps brakes on German bishops' synodal way until, big word there, until Universal Church considers proposals. Hmm. Let me first go to the CNA article uh, where its headline says, full text of statement by the Holy See on German synodal way. Let me read to you this statement, or at least, yeah, it's very short. It's pretty simple. Let me read it to you, just so you can get the, uh, the context here. It says, quote, in order to safeguard the freedom of the people of God and the exercise of the Episcopal ministry, it seems necessary to clarify that the synodal way in Germany does not have the power to compel bishops and the faithful to adopt new forms of governance, governance and new orientations of doctrine and morals. Oh, praise be to God. It's good. We don't want them to compel the faithful to have to contradict church teaching, doctrines and dogma, what we believe, what we believe even in natural law, right? The uh, statement from the Vatican goes on to say, quote, it would not be lawful to initiate in the dioceses prior to an agreed understanding at the level of the universal church, new official structures or doctrines, which would constitute a violation of ecclesial communion and a threat to the unity of the church. In this sense, the Holy Father called to mind in his letter to the pilgrim people of God in Germany, the universal church lives in and of the particular churches, just as the particular churches live and flourish in and from the universal church. If they find themselves separated from the entire ecclesial body, they weaken, rot, and die. 
Hence, the need always to ensure communion with the whole body of the church. Therefore, it is desirable that the proposals made by the particular churches in Germany may be incorporated into the synodal process on which the universal church is undertaking in order to contribute to mutual enrichment and to bear witness to the unity with which the body of the church manifests its fidelity to Christ the Lord. Close quote. Now, I am not the Pope. I don't even look like the Pope. I don't... I, I have no say whatsoever in anything that happens officially in the Catholic Church. So uh, there you go. But if I were to write such a statement, it would have read something more along the lines of, Dear Germany, stop it! Or else. <laughs> and that would have been it. I mean, bottom line, <laughs> have a great day. And that would, have, like, that would have been the full statement whatsoever. But no, I think that last sentence is really the kicker in the whole thing. Like, yes, you can't be compelled. This, you got to be careful. You should be care Like, it's just sort of this circular language going on, which is pretty standard fare coming out of the Vatican. But, and oh, and by the way, we also just want to incorporate this into the big picture. Wait, hold on. What? I'm sorry. Did you just say you wanted to incorporate what they're doing in Germany <laughs> into the universal church? What? Hold on. Let's go to the uh, LifeSite News article here. The LifeSite News article looking at this says, quote, after the Vatican clarified today in a statement to the German bishops that the Synodal Way could not operate on its own apart from the Holy See without violating ecclesial communion, it then indicated that the proposals of the German prelates should be incorporated into the synodal process on which the universal church is traveling in order to contribute to mutual enrichment. Of <sighs> That is um, that is actually kind of scary, to be honest with you. you know, the art, you know, Joe. The thing about mutual enrichment, it's always kind mm -hmm. of like triggered mm -hmm. in my mind is mm -hmm. triggers. You know, is key word yeah, there. Triggers exactly. Mm -hmm. The idea of mutual mutual enrichment implies mm -hmm. that there is something good in both things. Like for instance, when you get married, you uh, ideally you would mutually enrich one another because you both have good things about you, you both have some virtues, and some of you both have vices, you both have defects, and you mutually enrich one another by mm -hmm. uh, complimenting one another. <laughs> I got At least it. ideally. Okay. I'm writing where, it down. Where, <laughs> I'm writing right, it down. right, right. I'm just giving you marriage advice. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> this and, is amazing. But the, the situation here, it implies that there is something mm -hmm. good in, every, in all these different things, right? Right. And sure. I think that's very dangerous to yeah. say you that they, they can, a little, a little bit, a little bit, I think a little bit. Um poquito, um poquito. as we say down south. Yes, um exactly. Poquito. Uh, the article goes on to say the clarification comes in the midst of a storm of controversy regarding the German bishop's proposal on changing the church's teaching on sexual, sexual morality, the nature of marriage, contraception, the ordained priesthood, holy communion, ecclesial governance, and abortion. Good grief. They didn't throw in uh, gravity in there. Maybe they ought to consider... You know, renouncing gravity. I'm fully in favor of that, by the way. Uh, I would love to get rid of gravity. It's always keeping you down? Yeah, yeah <laughs> trust me. Yes, it is. Anyway, uh, then they go on to read the statement, which I've just read for you from uh, the CNA article. But uh, skipping past that, it says, the most recent of the heretical proposals coming from Germany called for, quote, nationwide provision of abortion, close quote, a demand voiced uh, by uh, Ermi. Stetter Karp. Boy, I bet I messed that up, and I'm sorry. The Catholic laywoman who is co-president of the German Synodal Way. As LifeSite News reported earlier this year, a document approved by participants in a 174 to 22 vote calls for a re-evaluation of church teaching against homosexuality and revision of the catechism of the Catholic Church, claiming that homosexual acts are not a sin. Close quote. Yikes. The open dissent from Catholic moral teaching among the German Episcopate prompted Australian Cardinal George Pell in April to call on the Pope to reaffirm the unchanging doctrine and tradition of the Church. Quote, undoubtedly, the Holy Father will speak. We'll have to speak on this matter to clarify and reiterate the tradition. Uh, Pell said at the time in, in an interview, he goes on to say, quote, the special role of the papacy is to maintain the purity of the apostolic tradition and to maintain the unity of the church around that tradition, close quote. I wonder if they should like remind him of that by memo or something. Could they 
just send a little love note to His Holiness and say, by the way, your job is to <laughs> maintain the traditions handed on, the purity of the apostolic teaching. That would be you know, Joe, not not to not to go off on mm -hmm. a, a weird track here, but it just reminds me. You know, I, I'm a father, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, my my daughter, she's going to turn one next week, and she she loves Winnie the Pooh. So we we watch Winnie the Pooh. I think it's the, the '70s version of it. And there's a scene in this in this movie where uh, one of the characters is like looking for a house and he finds a house that belongs to somebody else and he's giving it away to somebody else. And everybody's kind of like every, all the characters are thinking like, oh, OK, well, you know, are you sure you want to do that? That house belongs to somebody else. Do you really want to do that? But everybody seems to be kind of jumping in and and allowing this character's delusions to allow him to to give this house that doesn't belong to him to somebody else. And it reminds me of the situation here, right? Yeah. We're, we're, we're expecting leadership from, from the top, from His Holiness, Pope Francis. And instead he's saying, well, you know, why don't we all just kind of, let's see, let's see if there's anything good here that could multi culturally enrich us here, mm -hmm. uh, mutually enrich us here. Yeah. You know, and, and in reality, we're just giving into the delusions of the German synodal way at, to the detriment of the entire church. This is a, a first step to opening the door for all all manner of crazy things all over the world, and yeah, we're we're just we're just flabbergasted that there, there's no leadership, there's no stop, there's no there doesn't seem to be any sort of filter at all. <laughs> it's yeah. just crazy, uh, but it gets better. I feel Rudy. like I'm taking crazy pills. It does get better. Uh, for instance, here's this other article out of LifeSite News where the headline says Vatican approved journalist. Suggest Pope Francis might soon contradict church's birth control ban. So <laughs> just wait. There's more. There's more. At least uh, we're getting clarity. <laughs> real quick here. It says a Vatican approved, Vatican approved publication has published an article asking if Pope Francis might write a new encyclical or apostolic exhortation on bioethics in line with a recent document from the Pontifical Academy for Life, which undermines certain aspects of Catholic morality. Now, we've discussed this already a couple of times this week alone, uh, but basically they put out this article. They're, they're calling into question whether or not contraception should become more normal under air quotes certain circumstances. For instance, like the Louisiana bishops have made that st sort of seemingly endorsing the use of a emergency contraception in the cases of rape. We discussed that with David L. Gray this week, by the way. Uh, but what I find interesting about this story is, one— the, uh, this uh, document that was published, usually they get approved by the Vatican prior to publishing. So were they on this one? I don't know, but there is an interesting link there. But there's another article out of CNA today. Uh, Pontifical Academy for Life board member church says church teaching on contraception has not changed. And I read through this article, and it's interesting. Dr. Monica Lopez Borjona, a member of the board of directors of the Pontifical Academy for Life and president of the Jerome Lejeune Foundation in Spain, has clarified that the recent publication of a book by the academy hasn't changed the bioethical magisterium of the church. Quote, it's not true that the church or the magisterium have changed their moral criteria regarding some questions of bioethics, not even that the Vatican has begun a process of reviewing these issues, Lopez stressed in a statement released in the form of an interview to which ACI uh, Presna, CNA Spanish language, sister news agency has access. Now, OK, so what's let me summarize, because we're getting down to the wire here on this segment. The interesting thing about this article over at CNA and this uh, this lady's comments about this is one, she's like making like sort of a generic statement. Yes, nothing has changed. We put out our articles and the church doesn't change just because we're having these conversations. OK, fair enough. But then in the interview, as this article at CNA sort of makes clear, she's basically throwing a shot back and saying, listen, this was never brought to the board's attention. We never discussed this prior to publication. They just went off and did this. You know, the Jesuit who published that article, that book, they just went off and did this of their own accord. They didn't ask our opinion or, or whether or not we thought this was a good idea. They just did it. So I think that this particular doctor is, is basically saying, this is not good. We're, we're not happy with this. We don't agree to this, but I'm just trying to read in between the lines there. But 
if, in fact, going back to Germany, they're simply saying, hey, hold up, guys. Let's just take some of your proposals and make them the law of the land for the whole church. That would be devastating and bad. Let's pray, fast, and do penance. Because that's what God has called us to. We'll be right back. Anthony Stein's Ave up Maria next. School of Law is the Roman Catholic law school in the U.S. Consistently ranked in the Princeton Review as one of the best and most conservative law schools, as well as pre-law's most devout law school. Ave Maria School of Law provides a traditional legal education while placing an emphasis on how the law intersects with the Catholic intellectual tradition and natural law philosophy. Ave Maria School of Law, unabashedly Catholic, consistently excellent. For more information, AveMariaLaw.edu. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Minute. Patriotism is a natural virtue. It's natural to love our country just as it's natural to love our family and love our home. But G.K. Chesterton says the true patriot is always a little sad. Now why is that? Because everyone who loves his country wishes it were better. Chesterton says we have to hate the world enough to want to change it and love it enough to think it worth changing. So when we criticize our nation, we do it out of love because we want to improve it and because we want to be proud of it. We obviously don't want to be ashamed of it. That's why we want our country to be virtuous and moral and godly. And Chesterton says, the more transcendental is your patriotism, the more practical are your politics. Want more than a minute? Visit us at Chesterton.org. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. And now more headlines. Breitbart reports U.S. leading economic indicators point to a recession at year's end. Hope you're ready for that. Prepare for that as much as you can. A widely followed index of leading economic indicators fell by more than expected in June and indicates a recession is likely by the end of the year, the U.S. Conference Board said on Thursday. Six of the ten board indicators were in negative territory in June. Uh, those, those, boards, uh, those indicators rather are reflecting diminished consumer expectations, climbing unemployment benefit claims, plunging stock markets, a fall in building permit applications, and a shrinking average work week. Orders for core capital goods and consumer goods from manufacturers made small positive contributions. The Epic Times reports police officer does CPR on seven-day-old baby after desperate dad runs into gas station for, ha for help. A pair of Louisville Metro policemen were making the rounds driving their beat when they came across a distressed father whose baby wasn't breathing. Officers Nicholas Green and Noah Cole stopped at a gas station to check in with the owner when a man hurriedly entered and called on the officers. Speaking only in Spanish, he told them his baby was in a bad way. The policemen rushed out with the man to his truck where the distressed mother handed their seven-day-old daughter, Emma, to Green, who performed CPR. Moments later, baby Emma was heard crying, and it seemed that the emergency had been diffused. Green, who said his heart rate was going through the roof, breathed a huge sigh of relief. He says, quote, when the baby started screaming and whining, he says, okay, we're gotten, we've gotten oxygen to the brain, he recalled. And that was the ultimate sigh of relief. And the Daily Wire reports Ford plans to cut 8,000 jobs so it could fund its elect electric vehicle push. Michigan auto giant Ford is planning on laying off up to 8,000 workers to help the, the company fund its electronic vehicle projects. The cuts, though still pending, are expected to be implemented in the coming weeks and will affect salaried workers as well as the automaker's new Ford Blue unit that was created in March to oversee internal combustion engine operations. And those were your headline news this morning. God love you. Praise be to God in all things. Thank you, Rudy, for keeping us up to date. We appreciate that. Praise be to God. Hey, don't forget, today's the day I send out the email to the CDT insiders. So if you want all the goodies that we're going to be sending to you today, make sure you're on the list. You can do that by going to grnonline.com forward slash CDT. And just look for the insider email list link, and you'll find that. It takes you just a, a minute to get on to the list, we're going to send you the uh, the talk by Father Bill Casey from the Fathers of Mercy right away just to say thank you for allowing me to harass you once a week in your inbox. But uh, again, go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT for the details. Joining us right now via Zoom chat is Dr. Anthony Stein. He has uh, a Ph.D. in public policy on agricultural 
uh, sustainable development, food systems, things like that. He has uh, a couple of YouTube channels that I know of. One is Return to Tradition, which I, f I follow and uh, watch uh, routinely every day. And then, of course, he has another one that I just discovered called Practical Carnivore. And he joins us now by Zoom chat. Good morning to you, Dr. Anthony Stein. Good morning. How are you all doing today? Praise be to God. We are alive. And that counts. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Yeah, praise be to Jesus. Now, I just joined this uh, this uh, this weird group of people on planet Earth, this philosophy, this occult, it seems, this carnivore group. <laughs> Uh, and already I'm a disgruntled uh, member of the body, and, uh, and that's another topic for another day. But uh, I was very fascinated to find that you have this channel called Practical Carnivore, and uh, we've been, uh, my wife and I have been watching these videos and learning a lot, so thank you for that. But we recently had a conversation, and I wanted to bring you in on it. I just saw a headline just today. It says, investors bet on meat grown in a lab as interest in plant-based foods cool down. That was on uh, MS, no, CNBC.com. Um, there's a lot of movement towards alternative proteins. In fact, the story I just recently talked about was the U.S. Navy in their funding budget having by 2023 to initiate a pilot program that feeds sailors with protein, something other than uh, from an animal. So, But it says plant-based or other and the other is what's scary. How do we think of these things from a Catholic perspective, Dr. Anthony Stein? I'm a big believer that we should be eating closer to our food should be coming closer from how God made it in the first place. That, you know, if you're in life, you're going to be spending money, extra money on something. Do it on your food. Spend money on higher quality food, organic if you can. Local, you know, let's bring a little Catholic social teaching into this. I mean, my dissertation was on... Uh, Catholic social teaching and sustainable development. That's what I got. <laughs> that was the final project. And, you know, in the work I do over there on that other channel, I, you know, try to be a little more implicitly Catholic and say, you know, get to know your local ranchers, your local farmers, get things from them if you can, keep the, you know, your financial resources in your community. But when it comes to the question of fake meat, I mean, there are two, th there are two ways to think about this. First, your and nothing that you're eating today is anything like what our ancestors ate, say, at the time of our Lord. It's just as simple as that. I mean, the the agricultural products produced today, we're talking your grains and your things, they're all franken foods, virtually all of them. They're all genetically modified. Every single plant out there is. It's why there is so much gluten problems, so many people with celiacs, everything else. None of that stuff is natural. Even the organic breads aren't, I mean, they're organic-ish, They're but they're unless you're buying ancestral grains, which are hard to, harder to come by than you might think. Some grocery stores carry them. There are a few producers who grow those, but guess what happens if you are growing ancestral grains on your property and your next door neighbor who's growing GMO wheat is growing something, is a next door. Pollin cross -pollin pollination, have pollinization, however that word is pronounced, kind of happens and your, your crops get corrupted. There have been lawsuits over this in the agricultural world. So, you know, the one side of thinking is, well, people eat this stuff already. They just eat the plants. They don't eat animals. But then, but in some ways, you might already be eating these fake animals. If you eat fast food chicken, there's a chance you're eating fake chicken, like cloned chicken or lab-grown chicken. And I have this on good authority from someone who knows the food industry from the inside, that a lot of these fast food places are already using GMO chicken or cloned chicken or lab-grown chicken. Um, and we already know, like several years ago, it was announced that there are salmon producers, salmon farms are producing fake salmon or cloned salmon. I guess it's technically a salmon. Just like if there was a human being who was cloned, would we say that person was not a human being who still had a, you know, who had a soul? It'd be an interesting thing to see the Vatican wrestle with, especially the modern Vatican. But, um, <laughs> but the, uh, so we're already probably eating some of this stuff, but that having been said, we don't know what the long-term effects are on this, of this are on people. And as for bugs, well, let me put it to this way. If you have a shellfish allergy, do not eat the bugs because it's already like there are products out there uh, like snack foods made with this stuff that will actually have a little shellfish warning on them that say, if you have a shellfish allergy, you are probably allergic to the crickets that are in this. You know, if you're, if you're in a survival situation, yes, go ahead, eat bugs that you find. People have done that since, you know, since the boat, basically. We've been doing that since time immemorial as a survival thing. But as a regular thing, there's no reason to do this. And they use environmental reasons for this as their excuse, even though 
animal agriculture is responsible for about 2% of carbon emissions in the United States. So there's no reason. Like, you, like if you want to tackle that problem, if it is a problem, if you want to tackle that, if you believe that's a problem, and you're not out there saying, how about modern nuclear energy to reduce the power emissions, the emissions from power consumption? I mean, modern nuclear power plants are safe. There's just, we hear nuclear and we think Chernobyl and Three Mile Island and people don't want to go there. If you're not starting there, which is something like 60% of our carbon, then you're, you're not taking it seriously, a problem you profess to believe in seriously. And if you are you know, not looking at the medical system, which, which is responsible for 10% of the carbon in the United States. And guess what? You're not taking the problem you profess to believe in all that seriously. And that means there's probably something else going on. You know, thinking about bugs here for a second, um, I've lived in various cultures around the world. Bugs are pretty common in other parts of the world. I mean, even in Mexico, there are communities that grow hornet uh, wasps nests inside their house and they harvest these these uh, wasps and they eat them as a delicacy. Uh, China is particularly fond of lots of bugs. Uh, John the Baptist ate locusts. So mm -hmm. on, on the surface as Catholics, do we have issues with eating bugs? On the surface, perhaps not, but there are dangers to it too. Like there are certain insects you can get parasites from eating. So I'd like to, I'm curious how the, the, the traditional cultures, you know, address that problem. Cause I'm sure they have some sort of remedy for it that's in their sort of ancestral knowledge bank that we just don't have. Our solution to that would be, well, here's another medication. <laughs> Big Pharma is smiling at all of this here. Right. You know? Yeah. And that's My, you know, not I, I, don't go, I don't go to the conspiracy stuff with this so much. I mean, yeah, you know, Satan Klaus Schwab is standing over, looming over all of this, right? Bill Gates is looming over all of this. But you can just follow the money. Who's making money from this? Mm -hmm. And there are people making money, including Bill Gates, actually. I mean, You've heard that he has bought tens of millions of acres of American farmland, right? While telling everybody to eat plant-based meat substitutes, he's <laughs> bought yeah. more farmland than any human being should be permitted to own, frankly. <laughs> yeah. By the way, we have interviewed a rancher on this uh, this show on a couple of occasions, and he has he has said that the 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 uh, alternative meat um, lobby has sent henchmen out to uh, to harass ranchers in their process. Now, I don't know how true that is, but reports like that do go around, and uh, it's not surprising to me at all. But I guess one of the big fundamental questions is, as Catholics, though, we would simply uh, uh, hold the ground to say we, sh we do not believe humans anywhere on planet Earth, no matter their creed, should be forced to have to change their way of life, change their way of farming and agriculture, and begin to adopt alternative proteins just because any government or, or world lobby says so. Would you say that's fair? Absolutely. I mean, there's the Catholic concept of subsidiarity. Hold that uh, thought this... right there. Sorry, Dr. Anthony Stein. Uh, we're at a break. We're going to pick up right there where we left off, but uh, don't go anywhere. Catholic Drive Time is going to come back after this break. More on alternative proteins from a Catholic perspective. And uh, what is the Catholic vision of sustainability? All of that coming up right after this break. Catholic Drive Time, we'll be right back. Hey, Donnie, in what gospel do we find the Hail Mary prayer? The gospel of Luke. Do we worship Mary? No. What do we do? Ask her to pray for us. As parents, we're the primary educators of our Catholic faith to our children. And if you don't know your Catholic faith as well as you should, that's okay. Just tune in daily to the Guadalupe Radio Network by logging online to grnonline.com. The Guadalupe Radio Network. Listen, learn, love, and pass it on. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your One Minute Tool for Catholic Evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Since you may not agree that the New Testament came to us through the oral tradition of the apostles, how do you believe it did come to us? So here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, a language aid. In Latin, the word tradition is a verb, not a noun. It's the act of handing over. Handing over what? Handing over the faith. You see, capital T tradition continues to answer the questions the Bible doesn't explicitly answer. For example, you've noticed that contraception or doctor-assisted suicide and many other crucial human topics are not laid out in the Bible. Secondly, analogous to baseball, the totality of baseball has been handed on to each generation. This is very different than just the small t tradition of saying not flipping the bat after hitting a home run. And thirdly, in case you're trying to rid church traditions to be non-traditional, just know that capital T tradition is what got you to Jesus. Drop kicking small religious traditions to be considered non-traditional is like the dog chasing his tail. His task is never fruitless and thoroughly silly. Praise 
is me to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Dr. Anthony Stein is our guest. He has a YouTube channel called Return to Tradition. I highly encourage you to check that out. But he also has another channel called Practical Carnivore, which I found recently. It's been uh, very helpful to my family. But just before the break, Dr. Stein, we were talking about the law of subsidiarity as Catholics, uh, because there seems to be a lot of pressure. A lot of these uh, riots around the world, uh, Sri Lanka, just yesterday I saw one in Ecuador, Panama. I mean, there's just a bunch of them. They all have common denominators, and that is the pressure of starvation and economic collapse is, uh, is alarming. So how do we as Catholics see uh, this pressure from uh, certain organizations around the world to get us to do away with how we farm, how we feed each other? Well, it's interesting because what attracted me as an area of study to sustainable development was the, the typical people I met who profess to believe in that sort of secular doctrine talk about localism go local go local go local i'm like well, that makes a lot of sense and then later i found the church was all about go local and had been for more than a century before these people came around but weirdly the secular people preaching this would say we have this we have environmental problem x our solution is an international governing body to take care of the problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, huh. It's almost Brilliant. like you've got this idea of like you kind of want to bring about a Star Trek world, basically, is what these people are trying to do. Yeah. And, you know, Klaus Schwab dresses like a Star Trek villain. You know, but, um, <laughs> yeah, that's that, but that's really kind of what's behind this. But you'll find a lot of like secular people who book big believers in sustainability who kind of deny to themselves what's really going on with this stuff, that they are all about localism, right? So, you know, I'm from Portland, Oregon, originally, a place I fled from because of just how insane the place has gotten. But it was a forerunner of a lot of the farmers markets and things, bringing those into cities, making it so you could buy your food directly from the people who produce food. That is a good thing. They made it so that you, in that city, you could use your, um, any government assisted food, like food stamps or whatever, at the farmers markets. In fact, they actually had a matching wow. program like, where you could actually take and be like, because of how expensive farmers markets in Portland are, they're like, well, we'll match you a certain amount of money. You know, you'll get a, you'll get some credits that the farmers in, in the form of these little wooden coins or whatever you give them to the, the farmer that you buy from, and then they get reimbursed for it. And you get so you're essentially getting extra money if you buy from the food to help bring the um, the cost down. <laughs> That's you awesome. Know, I can't believe I'm saying good things about Portland right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, I think we forget that the church gave us a roadmap going back to Leo the 13th, who was really just bringing Thomistic ideas into, you know, the social realm back in the 19th century. Mm. The church gave us a roadmap for how to address any of these problems. And really they're applicable to today, especially in, when you look at these food riots where, I mean, most of these are coming down because the World Economic Forum is telling people, hey, you know, we want to reduce methane and nitrogen emissions by 30% in the next seven years. So implement this. And oh, look, that means reduced animal agriculture, reduced agriculture in general. At a, and they're doing this at a time when we're being told about food shortages because of the Russia-Ukraine thing. There's not going to be any fertilizer available or a severely reduced amount, which by the way, why doesn't the United States produce fertilizer in any real amounts. Does anybody know the answer to that question? I have a suspicion about why that is. It's almost as if, uh, Mr. Stein, they don't actually care about the people. It's almost as if they, yeah. they're they just forcing your hand in a sort of way. Well, the, before you jump in, I know what you're going to do next, but let me, let me just say to follow up to that, there is part of the plan is to reorganize the planet on who gets to grow what. So even though, dear farmer and rancher, you've been growing X uh, crop uh, for the last seven generations, we no longer do that in this country. This country will now be responsible for this product, and that country mm. will be responsible for that product. It is a world reorganization that is also scary to me. Uh, Rudy, what were you going to say? Yeah, I wanted to to get into a, a very practical way of looking at this. You know, for for Catholic, it's very important for us, like as you said, to to think locally and act locally. Uh, I know f farmers markets are are pretty pretty widespread at this moment, but you know if somebody wanted to get fresher ingredients, uh, uh, actually good meat and that sort of thing, that's not fed with uh, with all of these different fillers and all that sort of thing. What do you suggest, Mr. Sh Mr. Stein? Do you do you suggest uh, uh, farmers markets or 
you know, there's also a rise of, uh, of uh, these, these services where you can get it delivered to your door. What, what do you think about those sorts of things? The services are better are better than going to the grocery store because, you know, there's one called Butcher Box. I've never used it, but I've watched enough, you know, carnivore and keto influencers who all seem to be pitching that that service to know that they offer grass fed beef and they offer actual wild caught Alaskan salmon and things like that. So you're getting better quality food. But more practical thing to do would be, and you can do this on almost everywhere. I've actually got a, someone who watches my videos on my other channel on uh um, out of Hawaii who buys beef locally. So if they can grow, if they can grow cattle up out in Hawaii, they can do it pretty much anywhere. And I recommend getting to know your local rancher. So like last night I went and visited, um, a rancher who comes out to uh, the mall in my town. He parks in the parking lot, sells his beef that he raised and had slaughtered himself. He didn't do the job himself, but he had that part contracted out and he sells it frozen out of the back of his own truck. And this is grass fed grain finished beef no corn or soy in the, in the finishing either. It's oh, all wow. like oats and barley. So this is, and this is like fancy restaurant quality beef that I'm paying Walmart prices for, or pretty close. Really? And I'm willing to pay a little, yeah. And I'm willing to pay a little extra for meat because for, to keep the money in town, something that I know mm -hmm. is healthy. Right. And, you know, he, we, he and I were talking and he was, he actually mentioned here at a couple people in another town over that he goes and sells at mentioning my channel, <laughs> my carnivore <laughs> channel, which I find funny, but he was, Telling, we were talking about what's coming in the next few months, and he said by spring you should expect beef at the grocery store to cost three times what it does now because of fertilizer, because of supply chain issues. He says he, he doesn't think that's going to affect him because of the way he does things, but just be warned. And this is why people should get to know what your local sources of meat are, your beef, your pork, chicken, eggs, any of that stuff. Start learning where that is. Um, some secular people are pointing out that we're probably entering the era of the return of the victory garden which is fine. You know, if your ground will do it, my backyard is very dense soil. So we're in the process of getting, you know, raised planters for plants and things. You yeah. Know, here in Houston, we have clay soil, so it's very hard to, to plant. <laughs> but enough people grow corn out here and tomatoes and other things that somebody's figured out how to do it, but I, I don't have a green thumb, but you know, we'll make do. <laughs> you know, that's interesting that you're bringing that up. And now I'm just thinking if, if everybody, listened to you and went out to their local farmers and were like, okay, we're going to buy local beef, local food, things like that. Would that actually be possible if too many people started asking the local farmers and ranchers to get meat and, and their grains and things like that from them? Is that sustainable? Uh, no, no if, not if everybody did it, but what'll happen is if people who are aware of these things started doing it, it'll probably, it'll create, you know, we're, you'll get back into the, you know, old fashioned market ideas, right? The, the old supply and demand thing, all of a sudden you're creating more demand. So what will the farmers do? If they can do so, they will, they will begin to work, do things to increase their supply. A couple of problems with that though, is um, there are some prepping YouTube channels pointing out that some of these are farmers pointing out that a lot of ranchers are culling their herds right now because of the lack of feed, mm. which is why your beef is going to go up in price in the spring by three times. And so I, you know, I asked, uh, like I'm, you know, the, the, the rancher I bought from, I actually bought half a cow from him in the spring and he's already got me down for a full cow. I'm going to take the steps to make sure I have the space for it. Uh, wait, probably by Christmas, I'll have that thing. And that'll be enough to get my family through till next summer. I mean, a full cow we're talking, mm -hmm. you know, like a thousand, not a thousand pounds of beef, but you know, 700 pounds of beef or something ridiculous like that. But people should begin to take steps, you know, even if you're going to like the grocery store and just buying canned stuff just to make sure, because it's not just going to be meat that goes up three times in price. You're going to be paying, you know, $6 for a loaf of bread probably. And by the way, the fuel price is coming down right now. That's a big factor too. Look at the price of diesel. What do you think, uh, uh, you know, a rancher has to do? They have to transport the cattle they buy, like the young calf to their farm. They have to buy feed. A lot of them will buy feed to supplement the grazing. Well, that means it has to be transported. So that transportation cost is going up, which is being factored into the total price they're paying. And then they have to take their cows to slaughter. That gets factored in. And there's probably other things I'm not even mentioning that fuel impacts their cost, plus any other business-related costs for fuel. So that gets into your costs. And our fuel crisis in America right now is completely voluntary, done by the idiot-in-chief running our country. Pardon my very uncharitable way of describing him, but at this point, they're either morons or they're doing it on purpose. I'm not sure which. <laughs> Given the things they say, I actually don't know which one it is. In this, in the state of Texas, there is a major culling of the of the herds. In fact, mm -hmm. we saw a report uh, just a couple weeks ago, three-mile-long lines 
of ranchers taking their cattle to uh, to market, which means the price of uh, auctioning them off the rancher that's going to get uh, p- you know pennies on the dollar. And as you said, that's going to affect the grocery store price as well. Now, the upside to that, though, I've heard some say if you have land and you have grass on that land, this may be a great time to buy you know, a cow-calf pair because you could probably get it at the cheapest possible price at this time if you can feed them. And that's the big trick. And if you know what you're doing. And also, here's the thing. The um, the rancher I buy from told me that he's getting a lot of business because there's a there's a couple of ranchers in our area that people have bought beef from directly and the quality wasn't very good because they weren't doing a very good job. And so he who sells premium beef at a similar price, they're going to him instead. And I'm going to sit down with him for my other channel and actually get an interview with him so people know what to do to buy their beef, how to get beef wholesale from the rancher, how to do it so you don't sit there and cut into your nice ribeye steak. You're like, oh, I just got the big box of beef. I'm going to cut get the choice cut of steak out. You bite into it, and it's chewy and flavorless. And <laughs> now you've, you know, now you've, you've lost $1,000 and a huge amount of meat to get a huge amount of basically prison food. Because there are various grades of beef. <laughs> and the stuff you buy at the grocery store is at least one step above what they're put it, feeding to soldiers, prisoners, and kids in school. Yeah, and there's been an increased number of uh, hunters as of uh, recently because mm-hmm. of a lot of these factors. I hunt, we... We love venison meat in the freezer. I just had some elk meat this week, some axis I'm deer jealous. meat. Oh, so <laughs> good. It's just... I, I live in sportsman country, right? Like, I'll drive on back highways places, and you will see deer on the side of the road that have, that have been hit by cars. I mean, right. this is sportsman country. But I don't have a background in hunting. I would love to find somebody who would happily teach me at my age to, you know, how Come to do it. Come on by. Let's go hunting. Me and you, we're going to do this. Well, yeah. Where, where are you located? <laughs> uh, well, we'll figure that out after. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't grow up hunting. I, I started hunting just only really a handful of years ago. And uh, it is uh, my kids love. I butcher myself, everything. And it's been an experience to learn how food is processed, to have an appreciation for the sacrifice the animal has to make in order to feed my family. Uh, That has been an education that I couldn't have paid for elsewhere. So uh, it is a great thing. But we're out of time. Dr. Anthony Stein is our guest. We're grateful for you being on the program today. Check him out at Practical Carnivore on YouTube or Return to Tradition. Dr. Stein, God bless you. God love you. Have a great day, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. That's going to do it for hour number one. If you can join us in the second hour, we're going to have uh, Dave Palmer, our friend from Back to the Father. And we're going to talk about what St. Thomas Aquinas might think of fake meat, alternative proteins. That's coming up in the next hour, plus giving away prizes. Join us online if you can, grnonline.com forward slash CDT. God bless you. God bless you. See you Monday. In 1981, Cardinal Carlo Caffara was commissioned to open the John Paul II Institute on Marriage and the Family in Rome. He wrote a letter to Sister Lucia, the last of the three seers at Fatima, asking for her prayers for this endeavor. The letter had to be sent through her bishop, so the cardinal did not expect a reply. However, he did receive a reply saying, Father, a time will come when the decisive battle between the kingdom of Christ and Satan will be over marriage and the family. And those who will work for the good of the family will experience persecution and tribulation. But do not be afraid because Our Lady has already crushed his head. Clearly, we are in those times. You may be experiencing tribulation in your own home. Recognize from whom that is coming. It's not your spouse. Stop fighting each other and together fight the evil one who is trying to come between you. Remember, Our Lady has already crushed his head. This has been a minute for your marriage and family from the Three Hearts Institute. You can connect with us on Instagram. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Have you ever replaced pronouns in the Bible such as who, whom, whosoever, ye, you, etc., and replaced those words with your name and therefore you personalize the Bible to yourself? Do you do that? Is that a safe way to read the Bible? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, Bible complexity. Mechanics study motors. Architects study design. Linguists study syntax. But for the most part, Christians don't study the how-tos of safe biblical interpretation 
called hermeneutics. Secondly, Aquinas. In the Summa, we see the caution. Aquinas says of the Bible, quote, the manner of its speech transcends every science because in one and the same sentence, while it describes a fact, it reveals a mystery and thoroughly a tough comeback. I know it seems plausible to simply say the Bible is a love letter straight from God to humanity, but wait a minute. A sentence or a paragraph in a love letter has context. Yes, with great caution, we can personalize some context, but remember, when you're at the central figure in the Bible, God isn't, and that's just wrong. Are you on the CDT Insider email list? Hi, Joe McLean here. And every week I send you cool stuff straight to your inbox, goodies that you're not going to want to miss. Go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT and get signed up today. Jesus Christ, welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired, I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Today's that day. It's uh, it's Friday, which means the weekend is, is upon you. Praise be to God. But also it means that we're going to be giving out prizes coming up at 15 past this hour. So if you would like your chance to win this week's prize pack, well, you get three more chances at that. And you have to be the first caller when we give you the phone number. So if you want that chance, you better be ready to dial that number when I give it to you. But between me and you, okay, just just don't tell anybody I told you this, all right? I don't want to make it unfair, all right? But between me and you, if you were to go to the website and look for the fear and trembling link, you may just find the phone number there, which means you can call ahead, sit on hold, hedge your bet. I'm just saying. But while you're there, also sign up for the email list. Go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT. I'm going to be sending you some goodies later today to include Rudy's uh, little memory hole video series that he's been putting out every Friday now, praise be to God, which is designed to to what? Uh, help us uh, not forget the stuff that they want us to forget. Dear listener, let me ask you this. You listen to the news every morning. Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we pitch it to you. How many of the stories do you actually remember? Oof. The news cycle is so fast. It's so fast. And there's often little stories here and there that are actually big stories. They get passed out on Fridays or in the middle of the night. You never hear about them, but they have big implications on your life. And so the memory hole news segment is just a way to remind you of those big stories, the things that you're going to forget in our super fast, super fast news cycle. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it's been fun. I like doing it. It's Praise pretty, be to God. pretty good. Praise be to God. Thought well. about not doing it today, but... Uh, the show must go on. The show must go on. <laughs> so that email will hit your inbox later today. Plus, I have some extra stuff to send you as well. Uh, I think we have, uh, we, in fact, we have a piece of uh, good news from our prize sponsor this week yeah. to anyone who's interested. Mm -hmm. So we'll send that to you in the email as well as some other stuff. So just, uh, make sure to get on our insider email list at grnonline.com forward slash CDT. But uh, we just wrapped up a great conversation with Anthony Stein. Uh, he has a PhD in uh, public policy for agriculture and uh, sustainable living from even, I think, was it from a Catholic perspective? I think he said that. So uh, praise be to God for that. And we, interesting conversation about meat, you know, and farming and the pressures in this world to change everything we know to go more corporate and more insane. Um, so if you missed that conversation and you would like to hear it, make sure to get on to our podcast feed, which you can find on our website. You can find on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, but you can also download the Guadalupe Radio Network mobile app on your device and listen right there. It's probably the best way, in my opinion, to stay connected. Just search your app store for the Guadalupe Radio Network. You can listen to your local live GRN radio station, find programming information, get connected to your local general manager, to your GRN station, and in the flyout, listen to the Catholic Drive Time podcast, all in your app store to search for the Guadalupe Radio Network. Praise be to God. All right, uh, let's, uh, you know, it's Friday, which means uh, Dave Palmer, our friend from the wild north, the great tundra of the north, uh, is uh, joining us this morning. He is the host of a show called Back to the Father, in addition to his executive directorship of the North Texas Stations, in the Guadalupe Radio Network on the English side. Good morning to you, Dave Palmer. 
Good morning, Joe. Yeah, from the, the big tundra up here with 105 <laughs> degree temperatures. 105. Uh, wow. Yeah, we're chilly. Below zero, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, something like that. It was uh, 110 yesterday. At least it felt like 110 yesterday. And that was in Houston. Ooh, Houston. Like, so it is pretty cold up there. It's it's amazing. Um, <laughs> we just wrapped up an interesting conversation I'd like to get your take on before we uh, talk about something else. Um Anthony Stein, we were talking about alternative proteins and the pressures uh, to feed people with something other than proteins from from meat, from animals. They, you know, lab grown meat is a thing. Um, bugs are now more of a thing. What would Thomas Aquinas say about lab grown meat? Do you think? <laughs> I'm trying to think of the exact citation in the sumo <laughs> where that it's is. It's in there. It's in there. It's escaping me, it's, but I, I think it's in prima pars. Uh, no, you know, I, I, I agree with what you were saying, Joe, is that, uh, you know, I think people ought to be left alone. I'm paraphrasing that to, to make their own decisions. And some, you know, people like, you know, Bill Gates or Klaus Schwab kind of want to impose them and, and as Anthony said, uh, but pretty much to, so they could make a bunch of money. But yeah, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a loss as to what Aquinas exactly would say about that. But he, he would certainly be in favor of us having free will and things that were, mm-hmm. uh, you know, not, not necessarily a moral choice, but uh, being being free agents to make up our own minds about things like that. You know, I, I think Thomas Aquinas is famous for not paying attention or caring about what he ate. Like, he was so myopically focused on what he was doing, writing, that he whatever they put in front of him is what he ate. He didn't think twice about it. Is that is that true? Yeah, I've heard different opinions on that. Some people have said, well, he's just a, a big guy. You know, he wasn't necessarily fat. And he wrote so much on the virtue that it seems like it would be hard to believe that he would have been gluttonous because so much of the Summa has to do with uh, tempering the, you know, the, 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 the passions, the concupiscences in order that we can focus on the higher things of life, like contemplation of God. So it, it's hard for me to believe that he would have been that intemperate in food that, you, you know, like, like you say, he would have eaten everything. And, and, and you know, and he had the, uh, the famous story of being gifted with not having the concupiscence when it comes to sexuality, when he was up in the tower and, uh, Adrian's probably familiar with the story. How you know, you know he was he was kind of uh, rid of that particular temptation in order to focus on his studies and in order to focus. So I don't know. I, I, I find it very hard to believe that a guy like St. Thomas Aquinas would have uh, been gluttonous. Yeah, I do too. But I do find it interesting because uh, the food in our day is not quite the same as the food in his day. Ours is highly manipulated by corporate uh, corporatizing uh, our our farming, our ranching, and our processing, and it's caused lots of health issues. So uh, the, a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with, they would not have known anything like this in his day. So it wouldn't surprise me if there was no mention of any of this uh, even remote uh, theme or topic in the Summa. But nonetheless, uh, that is not why you're here. Um, you, <laughs> sir, uh, are, uh, there's no show today, right? Like the back to the fathers on pause today. Yeah. We had our summer speaker series event last night with Father Ooh, Bishop Strickland. How'd and it go? So we get the day. It, it was really, really good. You know, it, 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 we've done this 14 times now and, you know, you always have that, that high afterwards, that, that exhilaration and, you know, you get to meet, you know, see so many people and it's just so much fun. But I will say so many people came up and said this was their favorite one ever. Really? And Bishop Strickland just absolutely knocked it out of the park. We, uh, I, I have so much respect for him. He, um, we had a, a transmitter of the faith award recipient last night, a very humble, sweet lady named Carla Lacroix who got up there and just blew everybody away with her comments. Wow. And, you know, she's, she's a, a retired librarian. I don't know that she has any experience public speaking, but Bishop Strickland got up there and basically said, boy, that that's hard to follow. And he basically he catered his entire talk to what Carla had said, which shows how wow. spontaneous he is. Because wow. he's like, I was going to go this direction, but now I'm going to go this direction. Uh, but it, it was it was a really really anointed evening. So yeah, we were Praise very blessed. It was, it was it was wonderful. Full house. Yeah, yeah, we had yeah we had five hundred and forty chairs. Wow. Somehow it looked like we had about five hundred and seventy five people, and and Praise I don't know God. where these people came from. I, I had a couple people walk in and say, hey, I, I didn't pay and I didn't register, but. 
uh, I'm here, and can I send you a check next week? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm like, well, you're here. So, <laughs> but, yeah, it was, it was def- definitely a full house. Praise be to God. That's amazing. Um, let's talk about the proofs of God. You know, uh, a lot, sometimes we find ourselves in conversations with coworkers, family members, strangers, and— you know, the, the, and more and more increasingly, it's not about, well, you know, Protestant versus Catholicism. It's more about belief in God versus no belief in God, the, the flying spaghetti monster thing. Uh, how, how should Catholics respond? What would St. Thomas Aquinas say? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there's such a problem these days with just basic belief in God, which I find amazing. Uh, you know, I tell people, I, there's no way I could not believe in God. I can't look, or look outside and see all the beauty around me and the human person and say, oh, yeah, I think this oh, just kind of pops here. But obviously, there are some people that claim to be atheists. I, I personally don't believe in atheists, but um, you know, but we do need to engage them in conversation. So, but yeah, my, my point, and when I teach the Summa, I tell my students, I think you need to have the five proofs memorized. I think you need to have these at the ready, because if nothing else, they're a great conversation piece, even for somebody who does believe, uh, to be able to say, you know, how do we prove this? You know, how do we make a point to somebody? Because, you know, the five proofs don't rely on authority. They don't rely on Scripture. They rely solely on the observation of the world. You know, it's interesting, Dave, because like you're saying, uh, the this rise in the new atheism kind of passed, and now there's a lot of people who are just practical atheists. They're just like, well, you know, I just don't, I just don't believe in God, and there's no good reasons to believe in God. And, and I think nowadays, especially if you want to fortify your children and fortify yourself whenever this comes up, yeah, learning the five proofs. Uh, is a great idea. You mentioned to me, you're like, whenever you become, uh, when you become a Catholic, they tell you, you got to learn your Ten Commandments, you got to learn the Beatitudes, you got to learn the ten, the uh, some of the basics of the faith, the Creed, the Hail Mary, the Our Father. And he said, I think that they should also learn the five proofs of the existence of God. How can people learn the five proofs without it being like this huge tome of work. Like, do I need to go and buy Ed Fazer's uh, five more proofs to the existence of God and read through that? Or how can someone learn them? Yeah, well, you know, it's, I find it interesting that the, the five proofs in, in the Summa are in Part 1, Question 2, Article 3. So it's literally 1, 2, 3 in the, in, in the Summa. I don't know if Thomas planned it that way, but it's kind of like the 1, 2, 3s. But, you know, they're, I mean, they're they're just a, a basic five things. I mean, the, the, the first mover, the first cause, possibility, necessity, degrees of perfection, and governance of the world. I mean, obviously, you need to go into a little bit deeper than that, but uh, I, I think it just should be at least, gosh, in Catholic schools, uh, like you say, part of that curriculum, because if if we don't you know, if God were not to exist, which is impossible, then all the other things that we're talking about, the Ten Commandments don't matter. <laughs> uh, you know, the Beatitudes don't matter. They, they, they're they irrelevant. And so if you don't start, that's why I think Thomas starts off so early in the Summa Question 2 with the existence of God, because it's the foundation for everything else that he's going to write about in the Summa. We're talking with Dave Palmer. He is the host of a show called Back to the Father, which uh, dives into the Summa Theologica from Thomas Aquinas, but sort of makes it easier to consume and, and uh, easier to understand from a knuckle-dragger's perspective. And by that, I meant, hey, I meant myself. So there's that. But, um, you know, I find it interesting because, like I said a minute ago, the debates used to be, um, you know, where is that in the Bible? We had a, we had a commenter yesterday on... YouTube from out of nowhere to say, hey, are we, have we gotten our Mary worship on yet? I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, like that is that is so 10 years ago, dude. Like, really? Uh, where, do, where do you Catholics find X, Y, or Z in Scripture was generally the conversation we would have on Catholic Radio. But now, really, it is, as we've been saying now, it's, it's really about belief in God at all. And yet, I mean, not only were Catholics not biblically prepared to answer Protestants on those questions, but now they're really not even prepared to answer atheists on the fundamental questions as well. And they find themselves stymied and they tend, it tends to rock their world. It tends to shake their faith when they find or find themselves in a conversation that feels like it's above their their pay grade. Uh, The risk is real, isn't it, Dave? Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of those people, you know, there's... You, you, you think about why, why do people not believe in God in the first place? 
I, I believe it, it often is an emotional response. You know, they, they lost. I, I talked to somebody just yesterday, and, uh, and, and, and she said a loved one lost. Um, somebody in their family that that he was close to, and he start he started not believe in God, you know. And so it wasn't that he didn't believe in God; is that he's mad at God. <laughs> he's, yeah. And so how do you when you're mad at God, somehow people start saying, "Well, then I, I'm not. I'm going to stop believing that you exist," you know. <clears throat> or the, that they just or they they look at the world and they see so much, you know, uh, uh, sadness and evil, and they say, mm. "Okay, there's no God." So it's really it's, it's secondary, but the belief in God. It's still there, but they're just kind of making an emotional response to it. Well, one thing they could do is to tune in to Back to the Father, which generally goes live every Friday at 1. But you can check out the back episodes on their YouTube channel. Check them out. Look for Back to the Father with Dave Palmer. God bless you, Dave. Thanks for being on with us today. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. All right. Thanks, Joe. You too. God bless you. Congratulations on your big event yesterday up in Dallas with Bishop Strickland. That's super awesome. Praise be to Jesus. Hey, we're going to be right back. Fear and Trilling is up next. What should I keep in mind when I'm trying to defend my faith? Well, number one, ingrain this into your psyche. The Bible is a Catholic book. The Catholic Church gave it to the world, which means there is nothing, nothing in the Bible that is contrary to anything in the Catholic faith, and there is nothing in the Catholic faith that is contrary to anything in the Bible. Always remember that. This is important to remember because a lot of times folks will quote a passage from the Bible that proves the Catholic Church is wrong. Whenever someone quotes your Bible verse that proves the Catholic Church is wrong on something, your response should be, Amen. I believe what the Bible says. As a Catholic, I believe everything the Bible says. However, I don't agree with your personal and fallible interpretation of that passage. And the reason you don't agree with their personal interpretation is because 100% of the time you're presented with a verse that proves the Catholic Church wrong, that verse has either A, been taken out of context, or B, the verse simply doesn't say what they're trying to make it say. Number two, and this flows directly from number one, the Catholic Church can be defended solely from the Bible better than any other Christian faith tradition can be. A good bit in the various Protestant faith traditions actually contradicts the Bible. So do not be afraid to engage non-Catholics in a discussion of the Bible. And number three, if you are ever asked a question about your faith that you cannot answer, don't worry. There is an answer for that question. You just need to go and find it. Simply respond, I don't know, but I will find out and get back to you. Then find out and get back to them. As Catholics, we need to reclaim the Bible. It's our book. We need to read it, pray it, learn it, and use it to bring our separated brothers and sisters back to the church. If you keep these things in mind, you have started down the road to being a very effective apologist for the Catholic faith. A beacon of truth in a troubled world. This is the Guadalupe Radio Network. Radio for your soul. Welcome to another round of fear and trembling. (laughs) The Catholic Trivia Game Show that helps you work out your salvation by the seat of your pants. It's a 50-50 chance and prizes are involved. Avoid the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Call now to take your shot. 877-757-9424. And now your host, Joe. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time and Fear and Trembling, the Catholic Trivia Game Show that has secrets and agendas that you're not allowed to tell anybody. All right? That's the deal. And if you promise me that you will not share my secrets or agendas, especially with Project Veritas, what would happen if they just put that out to the whole world on their massive Twitter following? Could you imagine? Actually tell Project Veritas so that they could put it out to the whole world. That would be great. At any rate, there are a few things we like to do on this game show segment. Number one, we like to teach the faith. So uh, we look for teachable moments in the questions where you just might learn something you did not know before about the Catholic faith. Praise be to God. The bragging rights will be amazing. Number two, we like to have a laugh. We like to have a good time. And our callers are actually certifiably a, a great They laugh with us. We appreciate that most. And then, of course, we give out prizes, which means it's a winner for everybody involved. And today's the day we do that, by the way. But here's the kicker. If you're new, let me explain. I do have three Catholic trivia questions sitting in front of me, but I do not ask the caller the questions, so they don't need to know the correct answers, but could still win the game. I will instead ask Rudy 
And I will, in, I will also ask Adrian, on one of them will give us a correct answer. The other will give us an incorrect answer. And then the caller will have 15 seconds on the clock to make a decision. Whomst do they trust more, Rudy or Adrian? And every correct answer will go into the coffee cup of divine providence to win this week's prize. Rudy, today's that day. Today's the day. Praise be to God. Our sponsor this week was St. Wave Apparel. And the winner that's going to get drawn out of the coffee cup of coffee cup of divine providence in just a few moments will be able to pick any one item from their Etsy store. It's pretty awesome. If you're uh, looking for a unique design, if you're looking for awesome bumper stickers, if you're looking for just incredible throwback aesthetics, you're going to be right at home with Saint Wave Apparel. Look them up on Etsy, Saint Wave Apparel. Uh, you don't need to be a saint to enjoy their garments, but it doesn't hurt. So mm. make sure also to sign up to our email list this week. We're going to send out an extra goodie. I cannot mm -hmm. mention it on air, mm -hmm. but we will send it out in the email today. So make sure to sign up for that if you want to if you want to cash in on that goodie. So okay, clarifying question: If in fact the winner is a saint, would they have to wait to the bodily resurrection before they obtain said prize? Uh, no, they just got to go mm, surfing. Yeah, they just go um, surfing. Saint wave. <laughs> Same way. All right, let's go to the phones instead. Hey, good morning to you. <laughs> Pesky Jesuit is back on the line here. Praise be to God. Good morning, Jim. Good morning. How are you doing? Well, we are alive, and that counts. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. They changed my name. Oh, they did? What oh, is it yes. now? I am Saint Killabug. I am, to, I am working Saint on becoming Killabug. the patron saint of exterminators. Yes. Yes. Saint that Killabug. That is my goal. Now, there's I a lot of people bugs. who are eating bugs uh, for their main protein source these days. Maybe you could just, like, you know, package them up and sell them at the local farmer's market oh, or yeah. something. Could a be an extra option. profit. I, could be an option. I got a story about the farmer's market, but... <laughs> for another time. For another time, Jim. For another time, yes. All right. Oh, it's good to hear your voice. Farm. Remind us one more time where you are from and where do you go to church? Abilene, Texas, and I go to St. Francis, All right. and I also go to Holy Family. I go back and forth when I'm, I get to lecture now at one of the churches, and so it's... All right. Praise be to God. Well, well, Abilene, Texas, beautiful part of Texas. We're glad you're on the phone again, Jim. And I know you know the rules, and I know you know how this uh, works, but uh, phew, me and you, buddy, are you ready? I'm ready. I don't know. Don't trust me. You should don't know, Jim. Me. Don't you do should it. Know. It's over for you. <laughs> Jim. I have it on my YouTube. Mm -hmm. I have the YouTube mm -hmm. on the TV, mm -hmm. cast on the TV, because I can look into the eyes and tell who's oh, being man. honest. I am your friend in this game. I'm going to close my eyes the whole and time. And Rudy now. is not wearing a tie, just so you know. He's no tie today. So <laughs> interpret that however you will, sir. Let's pray. We will start with Team Rudy, as is our custom, our uh, tradition, our Church-approved tradition, that is. A patrimony here on the show to yes. begin with Team Rudy. Mm. Good morning to you. Good morning. You look good with no tie. Hey, thanks. And, Appreciate uh, that. Hmm, wonder what that means. Uh, Rudy, are you ready, sir? I'm ready. Praise be to God. Are you sure? Um, I'm ready. Mm. Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> Not ready. I thought so. Not I, uh, beneath the veneer, <laughs> I just knew it. Jim, look into my eyes. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. Who is Peru's patron saint? Peru's patron saint. That's going to be Saint Nazca Potata. Nazca? An indigenous saint. Potata? Nazca Potata. Huh. Okay. Okay. Um... Sure. Let's just get a second opinion on this. Adrian, good morning to you. Howdy, howdy. Praise be to God. It's good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, you are, in fact, wearing a tie. I What? Which you always wear a tie. No, I'm not. So I never wear a tie. We're talking that about. as you will. But could you tell me who is patron? Who is the patron saint of the country of Peru? Well, you see, Rudy's answer kind of got me confused because, you know, I mean, like, I'm thinking mm -hmm. Saint Takir, ta Takiri, Taco, Takawita. Uh -huh. Like, these, these native saints, these Poor native lady. saints just <laughs> cannot, cannot get them out. So, <laughs> but I'm going to go with the man, the myth, the legend himself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be Saint Joseph. <laughs> oh. Mm -hmm. Oh. Not Saint Joe McLean. Oh, I thought you were going to say Saint Joseph. A cutie, the, but okay. Foster father of our Lord. My so favorite you, quote is uh, oh. when he says, same, dude. Same. 
All right, so let me wrap this up for you, Jim, to make some sense out of the shenanigans involved today. But uh, Adrian says it's St. Joseph who is the patron saint of Peru, whereas Rudy says it's St. Nazca Potata. I have no idea who that is. Uh, is the patron saint of Peru. 15 seconds on the clock, Jim. Who is right? Who is wrong? What say you, sir? I have to go with Adrian because I never heard of the other one. You, you just have to. It's not your fault, Jim. Don't feel no, bad. Actually, <laughs> don't, don't feel yeah, bad, Jim. If Rudy would have said St. Mm. Lima, he might have had me. Oh. oh. I was thinking about Nazca <laughs> lines and potatoes because they eat potatoes down, down there. Yeah, right. They got purple potato. potatoes. Potato, potata. Potatoes. Yes. Ah, Lord of the Rings. Gotta love yeah. it. All right. Uh, congratulations, Jim. You did not fall for that one. Uh, you are correct. St. Joseph is the patron saint of Peru. So congratulations. Well done. We're going get to get you into the cup with this next question, but you're going to have to be an expert on uh, the religious orders of the world. You have to know every single religious order or you're not going to get this In right. order to get this correct, yes. But we will go to Adrian, who is, in fact, an expert on the subject. And one might say a PhD in religious orderology. I don't know which one would say that, but okay. Hmm. Um, but let's go ask anyway. What religious order is represented by the uh, acronym SM? Mm, yes. Yeah, that would be the Society of Martins. Martins. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Martins. Hmm. Rudy. Can you tell me uh, what religious order is represented by the acronym SM? The Society of? Uh-huh. Mary. Uh, not Martins. No. Mary, you said. Mary, Mary our blessed mother. A little on the nose, huh, Rudy? <laughs> okay. Could be. Okay. Could be, huh? All right. Well, Jim, pesky, Jesuit, bug killer, extraordinaire, uh, you got choices. Rudy says SM stands for Society of Mary, whereas Adrian seems to think it's the Society of Martin. 15 seconds on the clock. Who's right? Who is wrong? Pesky Jesuit, what say you? By the act of free will, I'm going to go with Rudy. By the act of free will? You have free will? <laughs> what? How'd you get one of those? <laughs> How do you have free will if you're predestined? You're predestined to get it right? I don't right? have free will oh, whenever no. Bill Gates is buying up my property. Mm, <laughs> I don't know either. Uh, I, by the way, Rudy, are you an expert on any subject? I'm just curious. Uh, yeah. No, I'm not. I'm such a new, I'm a new Catholic. I'm only, it's been two years, 10 months, and six days. Well, congratulations. Welcome home, Jim. Welcome home. All right, third but question. I learn a lot from you guys, and I like to read. Praise from God. your lips to God's ears. That's all I'm going to say. All right, Pray for uh, us. third question, and easily the hardest question ever asked on Catholic Drive Time. Yeah, this is definitely the hardest question ever. And we agree, right? Yeah, this is, you're, you're you done for, dude. You are so done. Approximately 0% chance to get this right. If you hang up, Jim, right now, I will not fault you for it. Okay, I will not be at all. <laughs> but let's ask anyway, nonetheless. We're back to Rudy. Rudy, can you can you answer this for me? Okay, I'll try. Homiletics is the study of what? <laughs> all right. So you're you're up you're up at church, right? And you're like, yeah. man, you're sitting there, mm -hmm. gospels read, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you hear the best homily of your life. And what? You're like, wow. You just shattered. Right. You're shattered. It was amazing. Yeah. And you realize, man, that guy was really an artist at preaching. So ah. my answer is homiletics is a study of uh, the art of preaching. Art of preaching. Okay. Yeah. Adrian, That's could me. you help me out by telling me homiletics mm -hmm. is the study of what? As a PhD in homiletics, actually. Ooh. I know exactly what this word I means. See. Okay. And it's the study of murders. That's where what? we get the word homicide. Oh. It's the study of death. Root word. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim, uh, homiletics is that the study of homicides, death, as uh, Adrian seems to <laughs> morbidly <laughs> say, or is it the art of preaching, as Rudy is suggesting? Remember, he's an expert in nothing. Uh, Fifteen seconds on the clock. What say you, Jim? I gotta be honest, mm -hmm. it's Rudy, but I thought homiletics mm -hmm. was the study of interpretation. Well, and I thought, it's preaching. You're right. There we go. We're down to seconds now, Jim. It and I got be you. one right here in my you hand. It's Teresa. Oh, Teresa. Congratulations. Woo!
Jim, I'm so what sorry. What a wonderful name, by the way. Love it wasn't that name. God's holy will that you should win today, but you were fun. You're thinking of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the... That's what he's thinking of. Homiletics oh, is the okay. art of preaching is the correct answer, just for clarity. Jim, God bless you. God love you. Thanks for playing our game and being a part of the team, and have a great weekend to you, sir. That is going to do it for... Uh, the drive time on radio side join us in the after show we'd love to conversate with you gabriel castillo castillo is up on monday so we'll see you then thank you for joining us on your catholic drive time where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired join us monday through friday at the same time right here on your favorite catholic radio station don't forget to connect with us just go to facebook.com forward slash catholic Again, that's Facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Some homilies feel that way, Adrian. I was going to make that joke. We were running out of time. I was going to make a joke about homicide and people dying listening to sermons because what sermon, here's a fun fact, or here's a question for you. See who can answer it. What sermon killed a man? There was a sermon that happened very early on in the church, and the sermon was so long and so bad, or maybe it wasn't, it wasn't a bad sermon, but it was a very long sermon, and it killed someone. It literally killed someone. That's how where, I feel when where the is that from? too long. Show, tell me which saint gave a sermon so long that it killed someone. There's your uh, question for the day. Whoever gets it first uh, gets a uh, ding, ding, ding. That's all they get. Sorry. I'm not going to give you anything else. Christopher Chance got it already. Easy peasy. The he said world? the Sermon of St. Paul. Yep. That's no exactly way. right. Sermon of St. Paul. St. Paul was giving a sermon. And he preached for so long that somebody fell off the balcony and he died. And then St. Paul rose him from the dead. <laughs> so, so, sorry. And went back to preaching. And then he went back to preaching. Yeah. He's like, so, so anyway. Yeah. Um, he's like, so it, like, <laughs> now that we move that distraction, we can get back to the sermon. Wow, man. Uh, that was really rude. Anyway, so back to the sermon. So, yes, uh, maybe homiletics and homicide are related to one another. See, mm-hmm. always looking mm-hmm. for that loophole. I was gonna make that. I was gonna make a whole. Thing. I was gonna make a whole connection, make a whole joke about it, but uh, we just didn't have enough time. No, we so, ran out of yeah. time. Brothers, we have a lot of new commenters today. We do. do we? we have a lot. Jay Coke is on Odyssey. Praise be to God. All right, who's the new commenters? Well, let's see. Uh, let's just start off from the top. Alberto, good day to you, mate. Oh wait, you don't say that in England. You no. say something else. Uh, Governor? Pesky, Governor. Hello, Governor. And we got Pesky, who was just on, and uh, Paul Wasik. Good morning to you. We got Neha Dixit, who is from India. So I think wow. she's a first time commentary. Praise be to God. She deserves it. She deserves a. Amen. Yeah. So Hallelujah. Good. We got Kimberly Sunderman. Good morning. And who else do we have? Professor G, who is a new commenter. Praise be uh, to God. We should. Let's ask Carlos? everybody. Did let's you guys get, get Carlos? Let's get everybody to pray for Professor G. He is going through RCIA to become a Catholic. Hey, Praise be to God. Welcome awesome. to the team, my yep. friend. That's awesome. I'm, let's here go. Jesus, there you go. Jesus. There you go. <laughs> you, yeah. That pretty much sums RCIA. Yeah. There so, you go. That's, I mean, here's the other lesson you need to learn. Yeah. Yes. That's now true. you're done. I mean, you're good. We're in the In fact, RCIA in a nutshell, right there. <laughs> that's all you need to learn. That's, that's pretty, all I've. I, that's all I know it. about. Hey, uh, Nanya is also on. Uh, that's a new commenter. Nanya business. I guess. Uh, Carlos. Yeah, Carlos. Clavel. Good morning to you. Let us know where you guys are from. Uh, we like to know that. Sean Marie. Let us know. Good morning. Let, let us know how you found the channel too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Please, I would love to know that. Becky Dominguez, we got, uh, let's see, who else do we have here? Christopher Velasquez, good morning. We had Return to Tradition, that was Mr. Stein. Good morning to you, uh, if you're still here. And we got a lot of, uh, oh, we got Mary Ty Gett. That's a new one, too. Congratulations. Good Good morning. We love the new commenters. Let us know where you're from. We'd we'd really like to know that. Tammy, good morning to you. 
Pesky Jesuit was spam on. Spam bots, well. what up? Oh, man, the How spam are bots. Doing? Are those new commenters too? Good. Oh, wait, they commented before. I report every John single Marie. one of those things, and it doesn't make a diff. They just keep coming back. Yvonne Steyer, good morning. I, Yvonne, I know I've, I've said this before, but, uh, you know, your little puppy on the, on the picture. Poor little puppy. Oh. He's cute. He was cute. Uh, let's see. Carlos, we mentioned Nuna. And then. I think that's it for YouTube here. Mm. All right. We don't think we have any new commenters on Facebook, but on Facebook, Christopher Chance, good morning. Uh, Patty, which she's not with us anymore. She goes to Mass, which is much better anyway. Uh, Lori, good morning to you. Lori said, no notifications this week. Yeah, we've been told that nobody's getting notifications anymore. Like, what's hmm. up with that? Yeah. So there you go, folks. Yeah. Uh, Susan, what good morning to that? you. Rick, good morning to you. Luz, good morning. Joaquin, good morning to you. Um, no, why is Facebook doing this? It's like <laughs> throwing me back to the bottom every time I try to scroll up. <laughs> Don't know why you're doing this. Gloria, good morning to you. Gloria was at the, uh, the Dallas, um, summer speaker, series summer speaker, speaker series. Series. Nice. Strickland. Strickland. That's right. And she yeah. said it was awesome. It's a great Good event. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, the, the venue is a flight museum. So you got aircraft hanging from the ceiling. Precariously, That's yeah. Dope. I mean, and then you got a whole <laughs> display <wire>. of <laughs> various military fighter jets and helicopters and spacecraft, and I mean, it's just the, it's just the coolest place to hang out. And then, of course, they have these like robust hors d'oeuvres. I'd call them robust. like not your like little finger foods, but like you get like a meal out of that deal. You mean hors d'oeuvres? Yes, with wine in in included. So the Ooh. summer speaker series up in up in. Uh, Dallas Fort Worth is really really good. On... I heard there was crowd surfing. I don't know that Bishop Strickland crowd surfed, but <laughs> everybody was like, Whoa. "Yeah, that was that was Saint Wave, right?" <laughs> no, that was the Life Team Mass. Stop it! Stop it! Yikes! Yeah, <laughs> Professor G, uh, Professor G's YouTube. Uh, yes, he said he went down the rabbit hole of Catholicism on YouTube, and he found y'all. He found us looking for ways to learn more about the faith. Praise be to God. We're glad professor you're here. G. What are you a professor of? Yeah, let professor us know. Professor G, be very curious. Yeah, and, being um, a G. <laughs> and definitely, especially during the after show, feel uh -huh. free to. Put any Chime questions, in. comments, yeah. concerns, so about exactly. the negativities, positivities, or anything so, in between. If you're new here, let me explain some housekeeping rules because uh, it seems like we have several new people uh, hanging out with us today. We're glad you're here. Praise be to God. Uh, we can literally talk about whatever you want. Except for a couple of things that Klaus Schwab won't let us. Yeah, other than that. <laughs> other than that. But here's the rules. If you do not actually direct the conversation, then the rules state very clearly we must talk about food, movies, or cars. So pff, I don't make the rules up. Yes, I do. But nonetheless, if you don't comment with whatever you want to talk about and tell us what to talk about, then we will uh, we'll talk about those other things. So anything else is on the table. Now, if you, you know, if you came to like insults, like I'm not suggesting you have, but like just give the example. The guy yesterday was like, have you got your Mary worship on? Like you're going to get. You're not going to get a great response out of that, okay? But if you would like to actually conversate about something the church teaches or why, feel free to put it. We're open to it. We can talk about whatever you'd like. Just let us know. Professor G said he's a law professor and immigration attorney. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. there, there you, you go. go. Praise be to God. Well, we're glad you're in RCA and coming home. Let us know if you got any questions that we can help answer with. Uh, oh, Odyssey team is, uh, is doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know who the other... Five people are in the background who have not commented. That's uh, us. Uh, no, <laughs> I, I already discounted us from the number. Oh, okay. Uh, but I see Jay Coke over there, Sci-Fi Mike, praise be to God. Good morning to Nelia. Good morning to you. Uh, I'm pretty sure Nick the Mike somewhere. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, I see Alaric is over there. Good morning to you, Alaric. Good to see you again, my friend. Uh, nice to see you. Also, by the way, our our Telegram group is alive and well this morning. Damon, I see you over there. Josh Knoll, good morning to you. Jeff Burrier, Tammy Marbury, uh, praise be to God. Good morning to you. And uh, Forrest Shannon, good morning to you, my friend. Uh, it's good to see you over there. Uh, welcome to the team this morning. And then, of course, on Rumble, we've got uh, Gunslinger Z19. That's Damon. Uh, usually Kendrickson's hanging out over there, but I don't see him here this morning. So I don't know. We'll see. What What's funny now? Alberto Cardinal soupage as in a bowl of soup. <laughs> soupage. 
That's good uh, stuff right there. Nice. Yeah. Uh, the pro- oh, the pro- I have a question. Yes, I will put the promo code for, what is the promo code for Saint Wave? You want me to just say it right now? You can now we're not now on the radio. We're, now we're not on air. Okay, yeah. so if, if, you, if you're not catching what we're putting down there, we're not allowed to say anything like that on air. On radio. Because FCC is going to like crack down on us. But the code, if you want to get 10% off of anything on St. Wave's Etsy store, you type in all capital letters, cat drive time. No H, cat drive time, as in a cat driving drive time. Cat drive time. You get mm. 10% off your order for St. Wave. So mm. I really appreciate that guy. His name is uh, Mr. Shapiro. He's really cool. He's just, just a cool guy. George I was, Convert? I was, I was looking through his, uh, his story yesterday and he has this really funny, uh, parody shirt of a punk, uh, a punk band called the Descendants. <laughs> no. And, uh, do you know the Descendants? No. no. Anyway. I well, wasn't big on punk bands. They have a character. I'm Catholic. <laughs> they, they, yeah. Well, Allegedly. most of the, most of the music is pretty lame, but they have a caricature for their, kind of mascot for all their albums and yeah. uh, he converted it into a parody for mm-hmm. for Catholicism. So mm-hmm. instead of des- descendants, it says mm-hmm. disciples. So mm-hmm. he, he has a lot of really funny, cool stuff. Lots of nostalgic stuff for me there. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Uh, did you guys hear? I don't know, dear listeners, I don't know if you heard this or not, but uh, uh, yesterday I announced that um, uh, I did not know this until it happened, but uh, Adrian, I'm sharing my desktop here, but uh Apparently, Adrian and uh, why come you not? There you go. Adrian and Rudy had an had an audience with His Holiness Pope Francis recently. <laughs> I was I Francis. was totally he slapped my hand. Unaware of this, I didn't get the invite. I didn't get to tag along. But uh, it was a wild night. I don't remember, even yeah. remember it. Yeah. yeah. Um, a nice Dominican habit you got there, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Looks good on you. It does look good on me. <laughs> Looks good I should get you. one. But should look at that bow tie. Look at that smug look on his face Dude. there. Uh, Rudy in the back. This background. guy, the guy in the bow tie is actually, mm. I think he's like the gift guy for the Vatican. Mm-hmm. Like he mm-hmm. he deals with all the gifts or something. I yeah. don't know. I see it. But, okay. Uh, Father, uh, the Holy Father looks very perturbed by the fact that he's getting this gift. He, he looks confused. Let's just say he's like trying to understand. Like, <laughs> hmm, like he's, like, he's probably thinking, uh, why are you looking me in the eye right now? So the look that the Pope is giving in this image, <laughs> the look that the Pope is giving in this image is what happened when I added uh, Marcel Lefebvre, Archbishop Lefebvre, into my head cannon. Uh-huh. And I was trying to start a cultist, and I had a guest over, and I asked Archbishop Lefebvre to pray for us, because we don't know if he's in heaven or whatever. I mean, it, that's how the cultist begins, right? You petition this particular person. If something comes through, then you can say, hey, by the way, you know, we've been praying, and this prayer's been answered. So I mentioned Archbishop Lefebvre, pray for us. We had some people over for dinner, and they were so scandalized that we <laughs> say that. <laughs> they had to look exactly uh, like Pope Francis. It's just, like, wait. And they're like, <gasps> What? what? Isn't he a schismatic? No. There you go. Uh, Master Baker seventy eight. Good morning to you. Good to see you, my friend. What's on the uh, What's on the menu today? What are you making this morning? I'd be curious. Uh, Master Baker also says my wife and I have been members of our parish RCIA team for five years. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thanks for serving. Yeah, um, we did. Um, I'm trying to think of what I'm going to eat for lunch today. I think I'm going to have bean fish sticks. Fish sticks. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Talk about fake Chain, meat. <laughs> Chain up a bit. From where? Talk about From fake. H-E-B. H-E-B. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Heb? Uh, Heb. Here everything's better. Here everything is better, they say. And then, uh, or B and cheese tacos, which is pretty oh. typical. Ooh. It's pretty typical. Did you guys see the question from Manya? Uh, let's see here. What is and judgment... Ginger. In terms, is that what that says? In, in terms of our faith. In terms of our faith, and when is it forbidden? Oh, oh like in other words, can we judging judge? others. Is that what you mean? Oh, I read that as interims. Yeah, I did too, and I was very I, confused. Yeah, so judging others. Uh, I think Manya, you should do it. My, my <laughs> is, just make sure we. I just want to make sure we we understand what you're asking. Dude, Are you what? asking us about Stop. thou shall not judge? Like in other words, uh, judging others. Like, is there is it forbidden to judge others? And there's this vampire again. Snore it. Why? I mean, you, I call it you as YouTube. You you want to block us because of something we say in passing, but you can't figure out how to block the spam, the the, the porn spam. Like, really? I don't believe it. I I speculate that they get a pass. 
just to harass us. All right. So are we allowed as Catholics to judge others? Good question. Yes. Yes. All right. Moving I'm, on. I'm, hold on. I, I got to put my <laughs> nose in the air a little bit and look down on the world. Are you Are you judging me? I am judging you. I'm going to put that tie shirt combo. Have I'm going to put that? this in the chat. There is a great video that... Um, the TFP put out mm -hmm. and it was on this exact topic. And I have never seen a more succinct um, explanation of the whole that's not judge thing because they get that all the time. Every time they go out protesting, like, yeah. right. God, don't you know that God mm. said thou shalt not judge? And it's like, do you believe in the Bible? Like, do you even have you read the Bible? Like, <laughs> are you even a Christian? Do you pray? And but they know the one line thou shalt not judge. And yeah. they bring it up over and over again. So yeah. the TFP put up this great video. Mr. Matthew, uh, is it Shibler? I think his last name. No, no, it's not Mr. Matthew Shibler. I forget his last name. Mr. Matthew, he did a video on this topic, um, but I'll let Joe continue what he's thought. Well, I, it's, I'm glad you're putting that out. So make sure we get that linked up everywhere. Yep, um, but at the end of the day, we cannot judge, as St. Paul would say, he doesn't even judge his own self. What does he mean by that? Eternal destiny. We can't judge our neighbor's final destiny. Because we don't know. We can't say whether or not our neighbor who may be doing things that is like, man, you see what he did? Like, you got to be kidding me. Uh, that doesn't mean he won't make it to heaven. We don't know. He could repent in his final moments like Constantine. Mm, that guy murdered his own family members. Just saying. Yeah, but a saint. Uh, uh, yeah, he is considered a saint in the East. So uh, it's possible God's mercy could prevail in the end. And praise be to God for that. We would want that. But that doesn't mean that you, we, we should not be judging. We have to, in fact, judge the fruits, as our Lord would say, by their fruit you shall know them. So we have to judge. It is a part of life. There's no way for, a, for a, uh, uh, the, the apostles, let alone the bishops who succeed them and the, uh, and the presbytery who serve them and assist in their ministry, as John chapter 20 tells us, to hear the sins of others and retain those that they retain and and uh, forgive those that they forgive. There's no way for them to know and to forgive unless they're judging, it's, you know, along the way. So we have to judge. We have to judge people and their circumstances and the situation, but we have to do so prudentially, mm -hmm. and we have to do so with some charity, of course. But nonetheless, judgment's part of life. So our Lord isn't condemning all judgments, just the judgment of final con condemnation, right? So in other words, that you're going to go to hell, like you're, you know, that kind of thing. That's the kind of thing we have to reserve judgment for, because the measure with which we measure other people's final destiny will be measured back to us. Right. So, and nuance. our Lord even tells us, "Beware of false prophets who come to you in the clothing of sheep, but inwardly they are ravening wolves." Like, how can mm -hmm. you be aware of false prophets if you're not making judgments? Yeah. So, our Lord is telling us to make judgments. He just tells us to do it properly. Don't do rash judgment. Don't condemn someone's soul. Um, and, but we have to make prudential decisions, like even basic judgments, like when you're walking down the street and you see somebody walking down the street and you're like, oh, maybe I should cross the street and walk somewhere else because I'm, you have me. to make, you have to make <laughs> judgments based off of where you are, yeah. uh, what the people are around you, what do mm -hmm. they look like, how they dress, how mm -hmm. are they talking, how, what do they have in their hands, right. uh, things like that. You'd have to make judgments. Otherwise you're going to be doing things that are going to just get yourself in trouble. Yeah, so but, that doesn't uh, mean we judge their soul. Right? Yeah. Uh, now. On, on the fruits themselves, uh, Christ himself has given us a standard by which to judge people. You know, if we, if we see that somebody is uh, publicly, in, in the case of our, our president, for example, publicly endorsing uh, something that is contrary to the faith, we have to judge that person. Mm -hmm. We have to say, no, that's wrong. That is against the teaching of the church, that uh, you're falling short of the, the dignity that, uh, that, uh, that's in you as a beloved cre creation of God. So judging is very important. Uh, we should do it, but again, with, with a little bit of caution. Yeah. <laughs> Judge rightly. Judge yeah. rightly. Bruce Toman, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us again today. We always get your... Uh... Nelia has another question, by the way. Yes, she does. I saw that. Get your emails is what I was going to say, Bruce. Uh, Nelia asks... If I, as she says, if I get the job at an Episcopal church, are there things I shouldn't participate in? That's a tough one. Their Nelia. prayers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a tough one. Like, certainly not their, their liturgy, right? Right. I don't think you should attend their liturgy. Yeah. Um, 
you know, depending on what your job is, of course, if it's just tasks, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But it can be very confusing. It could send the wrong signal and a, even a scandal could be caused, uh, you know, if it looks like you're endorsing their their flawed theology or something like that. Mm -hmm. So so definitely you can I mean, there's nothing wrong intrinsically with working at a non-Catholic school, uh, just like it wouldn't be wrong to work at a secular school. But the um, the one thing they just got to be careful of is like the whole deal with um, with praying with non-Catholics because it's a kind of a lost a lost teaching. Why are you showing your desktop? Because I was trying to share a meme <laughs> that okay. uh, yeah that that uh, where are we going with Chris, all this? <laughs> Christopher Chance sent me a meme that he wanted me to share, uh, and so I'm trying to share it. I but got it. Okay. The so yeah the the whole idea is. And this is kind of a lost teaching, so I mean, maybe we should talk further about it. But traditionally speaking, you could not pray with non-Catholics. You, it was actually considered a sin to pray with non-Catholics. And this actually is something. So whenever I'm at, like, for instance, a pro-life rally, and there's non-Catholics, even though it really blows my mind. Like, we had the March for Life in Dallas, and it's hosted by the Knights of Columbus. It's and paid for and endorsed by the diocese. This whole thing is just Catholics. Ninety-five percent of the people there are Catholics, yet they invite a Protestant pastor to go up there and give the opening prayer. I know. Like, what's right? up with that? Why, Why are we doing that? It doesn't make any sense. But they'll go up there and they'll give their their prayer. And I will stand in the back and I'll just pray a Hail Mary while they're praying. Um, but I don't pray with them. I just pray, I guess you could say, beside them. So the same thing. You could, if you're required to go to their liturgies, um, then I would say probably what you, this, you'd have to talk to, your, to a good priest to get their opinion. But my opinion would be that the, you, should, you could go, you would just have to not participate in the liturgy. So mm -hmm. you could attend but not participate in the liturgy. And St. Alphonse Liguori says, and I was trying to find the quote, he says, it is not permitted to be present at the sacred rites of infidels and heretics in such a way that you would be judged to be in communion with them. Uh, so that's one thing that he was said. And then Pius XI said, uh, the Apostolic See has never allowed its subjects to take part in the assemblies of non-Catholics, for the union of Christians can be only can only be promoted by promoting the return to the one true Church of Christ of those who are separated from it, for in the past they have unhappily left it. So the consistent teaching of the Church is don't pray with non-Catholics, don't go to their liturgies. If you have to, you can't go and seem like you're in communion with them. You can't seem like everything is hunky-dory and that you're endorsing it and you're praying with them. So I'd pray beside them and not pray with them. That would be my thing. Mm. Well, there you go. Uh, to, 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 I'm just looking around. You know, we're, so we were talking a minute ago about notifications and how our, there's, people are not getting our notifications that we're gone live on like Facebook, for instance. I, I, I feel like there's been a downturn on notifications that I've been seeing on Twitter as well. And uh, and YouTube has just never been a friend. <laughs> it's just been such such pain and suffering. This is the <laughs> meme that uh, that Chris Chance made. He said, "Let me see." Jesus said that God does not judge. What what Jesus said was that His Father gave Him the authority to judge the living and the dead. So, and the bottom one says, "Is nothing." Him just like looking at him, oh, giving him that look, like, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the problem with, with when you read sacred scripture and someone throws some one-liner out at you, you, you really have to dive deep into the passage to realize, okay, well, what is the context here? What is the intent the author is trying to communicate? And how does this jive with the rest of sacred scripture, the deposit of faith? Um, and generally speaking, you can almost, like, if someone throws a verse out at you and makes a statement that seems strange or weird, if you just go read the, uh, the, the whole chapter, generally that's what I do. I'll read the whole chapter that that verse is found in, and it will typically provide enough context for you to kind of go, mm, I don't know. Like, for instance, an another example of that might be uh, vain repetition. Jesus condemns all vain repetition. No, he doesn't. I mean, if that were true, then why do the angels in heaven... Uh, as listed in the book of Apocalypse and in the uh, the book of Isaiah and Zechariah, all repeat the same phrases over and over and over again, as if God doesn't know that that would be considered vain repetition if that were true. You see what I'm saying? Let alone himself repeating the same prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane, for instance. So 
Uh, context matters, right? We just got to get to that context. It does make a diff. Thanks, Tammy. <laughs> Tammy said that she has her alarm set on her phone to go off at 6 a.m. every every weekday as a reminder oh, wow. of your life. What a what a king or what a queen rather. What a queen. Good. Thank you, Tammy. Did you just impose your own? I uh, sorry, I forgot to ask like, you your pronouns. Yeah, I, I apologize. Dude, you're culpa. so Man insensitive. <laughs> Man, maxima culpa. Yeah. Uh, Second Kings two twenty three to twenty four. Someone, Jake Coke, just put that in. It says, I don't know, I'm just reading it, so hopefully this is relevant. Uh, it says, <laughs> from there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of, this is so funny. This is the new international version because it's just the first one Why that came up. Why are you up. reading the and, new cause international cause version? Because it's just the first one that popped up when I looked it up. Right. And, but hold on. This is, this is how it quotes. This is why Hashtag I stopped. Hashtag his favorite translation. So this is this is how it translates it. This is, this is why he paused because it's hilarious. <laughs> it says, so the boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, baldy. <laughs> <laughs> they said, get out of here, baldy. Yo. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when that happens, man. Oh, that's baldy. Oh, my goodness. Yikes. I'm dead, dude. Come here, you little I'm dead. Bird. Is yeah. that is I'm gonna go find the Dewey Range translation? It's a dynamic translation. Oh, so funny. Yvonne has a good question for you, Joe. Okay. Oh, she no. says, mm. since you're on the carnivore diet, what do you eat on Fridays? Uh, Fish. Uh, you know, the carnivore thing is just uh, suffering. <laughs> Pain. I love meat. You're in Spain. I, I absolutely love meat. But, yes but becoming a carnivore will make you hate meat. It's going to turn you into a vegan. It's not true. It's so true. It's not true. So, oh. He's making things up. Okay, so the Dwayne Rames is actually pretty similar, to be honest. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, let me just answer It says, thou bald head. Thou bald head. Mm -hmm. Baldy. So there you go. Uh, so today on the menu, I have eggs. I can always eat eggs. Mm. Uh, so praise be to God for eggs. I can also, um, I do have fish. Now, I am what, I am what Anthony Stein and the other carnivore zealots would say is a relaxed carnivore. Okay. <laughs> I'm not your strict Lame. lion. AKA a cool cat. I am not your lion you carnivore, strict, hardcore, carnivore kind of guy. I am much more uh, laid back. I like, for instance, I'm still drinking coffee, not made from animals, um, which is unfortunate because it's so good. And then uh, uh, spices. I don't have spices, but I am still using salt. Half and half. I could use half and half. I don't. I'm drinking it black, but um, that kind of thing. If I was strict hardcore, there wouldn't even be fish. I mean, I'm pretty sure Anthony would say that. I watched a video. I'm talking about this. You'd only eat like uh, capybara, r uh, ruminant um, meat from ruminant animals, animals that have two stomachs or two chambers in their stomachs, that kind of thing. Hmm. <clears throat> you'd eat their intestines every day or part of their in in internal organs, and then you would eat their meat, and that would be your... It'd be the the whole of your diet. The requirement, though, if you but eat I include the intestines, butter, I have pig fat that I could use to kind of add some fat to to something lean or something like that. But today I'll have eggs. I'll have a uh, fish. I heard that the requirement, though, if you're going to eat the entrails and stuff, that mm -hmm. you have to like mm -hmm. crouch over the animal and like mm -hmm. eat it with your bare hands. Oh, you know yeah. the natives, mm -hmm. the native, the Plains Indians were fond of that. When they would kill a buffalo, they would just. <laughs> Ugh. Eat up that those noise. Uh, <laughs> eat up <Yikes>. those intestines. <laughs> Yummy. Uh, now you could have honey. Honey is, I mean, they consider that part of an animal, even though it's an insect. Uh, but in fact, that is uh, that triggers the uh, that tr that that's a triggering it's a carb response. Yeah, it's a carb response, which is the part. So why would anybody go carnivore? Well, it's delicious. I can no. <clears throat> it's not true. Don't it's listen to fake news. It's uh, why am I going carnivore? Because I have some chronic health issues that are only going to get a lot worse. They're not going to get any better if I don't do something now. And uh, carnivore helps to overcome this particular types of, of uh, chronic issues that I'm suffering from. So there's that. But I love honey as a sweetener. I don't do sugar. I haven't done sugar in quite a while, except for like the occasional treat or whatever. But uh, otherwise, honey is my sweetener of choice. But I can't have that right now either, which means my coffee is extremely boring on the weekends. And that's kind of a frustration point for me. Don't drink coffee on the weekend. Because <laughs> every weekend, I always spice up the coffee with my honey, with Put my cocoa, my, my cinnamon. Oh, Put some salt and pepper so in your coffee and drink it that way. Unite your cross. 
to yeah. our blessed Lord and just say, oh, man, I really want to get rid of all that mm. purgatory time that I have accumulated. Yeah, maybe. A uh, forest says, I suppose the intestines are a muscle. No, it's not that they're muscle. It's not that you have to eat a muscle. It's that you have to eat product from an animal. Yep. So uh, the uh, the intestines, the muscles, liver, for instance, that kind of thing. Professor G wants to know if you could clarify about the Louisiana bishops approving abortifacients. Yeah. So I sent you the article. I put the article in the chat uh, for you, Professor G, so you could see. But basically what the deal is, we covered this with David L. Gray just the other day. And uh, let me see if I can get to that article real quick. Hold on. Here it goes. Here's the article. And we have just a minute or two here. Uh, Louisiana Bishops Conference endorses emergency contraception in cases of rape. Uh, the Louisiana Conference of Catholic Bishops has come out in favor of emergency contraception for cases of rape, despite the abortifacient nature of the measure of the Vatican's insistence that is morally impermissible. So what they're basically saying in a nutshell here, and I would encourage you to check out our conversation with David O'Gray. If a woman, God forbid, should ever be raped, and she is then tested to see if she's pregnant, and it turns out that she's not, the bishops in Louisiana seem to think that then it would be okay for her to take a contraception uh, in order to I prevent an implantation. But the problem is conception, life begins at conception, which means before the egg is ever even implanted in the woman's womb. And contraception being an abortifacient tries to subvert that process, so it's still it's still morally wrong. And uh, so this is a slippery slope. We think that this is on the same discussion as to why members of the Pontifical Academy of Life want to overturn Humani Vitae. But that's the, uh, the article has more detail. I encourage you to check that out. God bless you. God bless. Hey, Mike Koeniger, welcome back. We'll Thank see you guys Thank you for Monday. joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. I have a friend in Jesus. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus, 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 Jesus,